Um, so I was going to ask you to say a bit more about your memories of the amateur theatre scene in Ennis when you were um, a young gay boy trying to look, finding alternative, uh, I suppose, markers and signposts in the in the world. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean Ennis was a place that that you know touring productions of plays didn't come to at the time. Latterly, when I was about 17 or 18, the Ennis Arts Festival was set up, but before that, there was nothing. And I think that these musical societies, I was talking to Maura O'Connell about this actually, because she began singing in public through those, the Ennis Musical Society, and she remembered yeah. great figures that were there. And I think organizations like that kept towns together when there was nothing there. And uh, I remember seeing my dad being in the Mikado, for instance, he played Puba and the Mikado. And like, <clears throat> I thought it was magical when I saw it at the time. I, I shudder to think what the actual costumes were like, but I thought they were fantastic. I thought they looked like Japanese people and they had all the makeup and everything. I'm sure it was culturally inappropriate. It might get you cancelled on Twitter now. Um... It probably would. It looked as if they were wearing the curtains, you know, as kimonos. But it was really magical. And but also it was also a celebration of the town in lots of ways. I you'd see people in the, I don't know, the local man who worked in the book sh butcher shop, you know, whatever, Mr. Flynn, I'm making that name up, so don't sue me. And there'd be lads going, go on, go on, Flinny, go on. And then he'd sing this song, you know, or or the three women who worked at the post office would sing Three Little Maids from School. Are we it was magical, and it still is magical in my head. And I grew to love all of that. I and it that kind of magic was kind of what made me want to to be in to be in the theater. And I remember my dad, first of all, he'd be learning the lines at home and my mother would be reading opposite him. And then I'd see him every, you know, coming up to the 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 openings of the productions. He'd be gone most evenings and he'd be down there doing rehearsals. And uh, and my mom used to do the run the teas, uh, the tea and the biscuits and all of that at for the halftime out in the foyer of the Holy Family Hall. And, uh, but I'd see him after the production was over and I'd recognize a kind of deep sadness that all of that magic was over. Yeah. And I suppose I didn't want to live a life where that kind of magic ended. <laughs> so I kind of decided I'd love to be an actor. Although I didn't know how to do it, you know, I, I kind of, you, you had to make that bit up yourself. Yeah, isn't that something special about a small town that you can see people you know transformed yeah there's ways in, in which I, I often think that life in a small town or a village is more diverse in a in a lived way than new york or i totally agree with you like we had this guy in the town called michael tierney who is dead now but he was a really eccentric guy he used to deliver the clare champion from to the, the shops in the local town and he had this big sheep dog with him with him called paddy but he used to wear big hats and sombreros or Carmen Miranda hats, palazzo pants. It was the most painfully effeminate, oh, guy. If the women in the town, the local townie women were going away on holidays, he would have them browbeaten into bringing him back a hat. And then on the first Friday of every month, he used to do this thing for the widows in the town. He used to bring them on what he called a magical mystery tour which involved getting on a bus and driving to Kilkee and he would have the microphone in the bus and sing Carmen Miranda songs he had Elvis wigs that he used to have and I remember that once the boys in the town we were all walking to school and someone went oh Michael and the women in the town would nearly bait you for it and I remember I came out to my mother when I was younger and or I don't know she was saying about you know you know, you'd be the only gay in the village sort of feeling, but not quite. But we were talking about Michael Tierney and I said, well, sure, Michael is gay. And my mother's reaction was, he is not. And I think it had never occurred to a lot of them that Michael was just Michael. And a town as an ecosystem can hold that sometimes. That's right, yeah. You can't avoid people because you can't segregate and filter people off because, you know, it's your cousins or, you know, the the pharmacist or your neighbor, whereas in a big metropolis, you can kind of go into your little subgroup and not, not be, not encounter difference. I think there's a difficulty though. If you stand in a town like that back then and said, well, I'm a homosexual, but I'm not the town clown. Right. That's a problem. Right. And you've named something and you shouldn't have named it. Yeah. 
So I found, you know, when I was growing up, there was people down the road and their, their eldest son, who would have been a lot older than me, he worked on the airlines as a, as a, a steward. And he was very campy, he was bullied a lot in school. And I think he came out to them, but they threw him out of the house and he went and lived in New York and died of AIDS over there. And I believe that he sent word to them that he was dying and they didn't want to hear. And his sister went over and nursed him. Oh that kind of thing was also part of the town, you know. It wasn't all rosy. The kind of diversity had to be held and sometimes it had to be performative or it had to be, it had to be codified in a way that made it acceptable. There is, just as you're talking, I'm, it's reminding me of other people. And I wonder, is there something about Claire that seems to produce um, a certain kind of cultural stardom? I mean, Edna O'Brien is the uh, person I was thinking of, but there's also um, Sharon Shannon. There's, um, there's a list you could go on and on and on. And I suppose, is it is it the connection to music? Is that the... the I think music is a big, a big one. Um, the literature, I think there is uh, um, um, Edna, all right, but there wasn't... I didn't feel as if, you know, when I was growing up, I didn't feel as if some, certainly somebody from my class didn't have the right to claim that they would be an artist or something. I found that I was very conflicted about that word for a long time. Mm. Say I'm an artist. I still kind of go. Ugh. So you went um, before you became an art, an artiste, you, an went, artist. uh, you went to um, Galway. So I went to Galway for, for, I say, for about five minutes, but I went there for uh, a year. I, I, I crashed out of university life there, but I really disliked it intensely. And uh, you didn't go to study theatre, though, or English? No, I didn't. I went to study the wrong thing. I mean, I was studying maths and physics and chemistry and biology, I don't know what, science of some kind. And I had absolutely no interest in it. And I remember standing there on the registration day and I looked around and I thought, I'm not, I'm not going to finish this. And it's going to be a really big problem in my life. So it was a very stressful time. Um, and why do you think you weren't tempted into some kind of theatre world in, in Galway? And because you then... <clears throat> what I did do, I did work with the, with the drum sock there. And I did the first... I had never acted, you see. I'd never been in a play. And the first play I ever was in was in UCG. And it really, but I had always wanted to be an actor, but I, I felt I couldn't admit that to myself or to my family or anything. But I did a play when I was in college. It was a version of um, Jennifer Johnson's, it was Jennifer Johnson's play, The Nightingale and Not the Lark. Oh, yeah. And uh, I remember standing backstage before I went on that night and I was like, what the fuck am I doing? Like, I'm not an actor. I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't be doing this. And I'm terrified. And then I went out on stage and I was like, oh, my God. And the next day I was like, OK, this is this is serious. I want to do this. And but it involved having to crash out of college and disappointing the parents and and then slowly letting them know that I wanted to be an actor. And I went over and worked in Amsterdam for a year and I saved up some money and I, I applied for the Gaiety School of Acting. And what did you just tell us about what you did in Amsterdam? In the I worked. I worked in the in Europe's largest steel mill. <laughs> yeah, very, very butch, very butch. But I, Amsterdam was interesting because I'd never really seen pornography, or I'd never seen what I thought were other gay people. I'd never been really outside of the country for any. Uh, I went to a, a school tour to to London when I was in sixth class, or fifth class, or something like that. But suddenly it was like. I was there in the middle of this place where freedom was there for you. You just chose it, you know, and uh, and it was a fabulous, fabulous time, very transformative. And then I came back to Ireland and I was like, Jesus. So you did some kind of uh, version of finishing school in the... In, I did. In, I, in I, I finished myself off over in Amsterdam, all right. <laughs> And, and, and then you came back. And so that was the gaiety school then. So the, the idea then was to be become an actor. Yeah, well, I, I auditioned for the Gaiety School and I got turned down, actually. But I was quite determined and I, I kind of got on to them again and they said, well, you can audition again. So I came over and auditioned again and then I got in. Um, and was that your first real experience of Dublin when you went to the Gaiety Yeah, School? I'd never really known Dublin at all. And, uh, and I found Dublin to be... I thought it was fantastic. I thought it was a really 
it was a city that was in the, the throes of transforming itself in lots of ways. Um, it was 1990 into 1991. Uh, the city has, was really fallen down, but there was quite a vibrant emerging art scene. And I was in, in, in drama school with, I thought really interesting, fantastic people. They were very interesting and fantastic people. And I went to see plays really for the first time in my life or, you know, I learned, I think the one thing that I learned when I was in drama school was Joe Dowling was teaching us. And he said quite simply one day, the, the, the actor who doesn't go to see other plays is a fool and who doesn't read books is a fool and who doesn't go to the cinema all the time is a fool and who doesn't read, you know, go to the National Gallery and look at paintings is a fool. And I, I kind of realised that I think to, 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 to exist as an artist, you have to make your whole life your art. You have to be open to looking at things and opening to reading things. And, and then you can bring all of that stuff onto stage if you wish, or you can channel it into scripts if you want to write scripts or if you want to paint paintings. But you have to be alive to the world in loads of ways. You have to be open. And <clears throat> I didn't work very much as, a, as, a, as an actor in, the, in my 20s. I did bits and pieces and I gradually got larger parts and things. I did no television or no film work whatsoever. Um, but I educated myself. I, I did read all the books and I did read all the plays and I did go to all the plays and the dancing shows. And I went to the national galleries and I went to the cinema all the time. And I kind of built up a kind of, I don't know, I educated myself. Like I, uh, it's the only education I have, you know. Um, but you're also very much a theatre person, in, in yeah. it sounds like, in your, in, your, in your heart. And But then tell us how you became a writer. Well, I'd been working quite a lot in the gate theatre. And so I came off the back of like maybe five years of work where I was in nearly all the shows there for a while. And I really enjoyed it. But I felt that I had gone a little bit out of fashion with them for a while. They were kind of moving on to somebody else. And I could feel this kind of lull happening in my career. And my friend of mine, Michael James Ford, took over Beauty's Cafe Theatre. And he, you know, we'd share dressing rooms and he'd heard me shiting on about things or telling stories or blah, blah, blah. And he said, look, I booked you in to, to do a play. And I contacted David Wilmot and we decided, you know, we're going to have to write a play. And so with like four weeks to go, we wrote a play that went on in Beauties and it did very well for us. We brought it back a few times and blah, blah, blah. And we, I then wrote a play that was just me authoring it called The Head of Red O'Brien that went on for the Fringe Festival or something that was on then. And this was like 2000, 2001. And that went really well for me. And Johnny Spears, who was the producer of Adam and Paul, came to see it. And he asked me, did I have anything by way of an idea for a film script? And I had been, I'm a great diary keeper, and I had been observing street life near my flat, which was near Mountjoy Square, Parnell Square area. And I used to jot down what I saw, homeless heroin addicts, men and women, boys and girls doing every day if they'd done something funny or unusual, blah, blah, blah. And this had also come from my time when I first came to Dublin. I had never really seen heroin addicts. I didn't see them in Amsterdam when I was there. But I saw them on the streets of Dublin in a way that I hadn't seen before. And they moved slower. They spoke in a, in a particular way, in a shallow way. I saw a boy fall over in O'Connell Street in slow motion with this, the tip of a hypodermic syringe in one finger and the, the, the burnt out cigarette in another. And he fell down in slow motion. I found all these things fascinating and amazing and I had kept them in my diary. So I realized I wanted to tell a story set over a 24 hour period, sunrise to sunrise. Adam and Paul, you don't find out which one is which. And they just spend a whole day going around, uh, meeting their friends and trying to score heroin. And I wanted to bring in what was my favorite film at the time, which is Way Out West by Larlin Hardy and bring in elements of that kind of characterization or that kind of a double act into it. So I pitched this to him. Um, I had actually, sent away to the Irish Film Board for, for funding to do a draft of it. And they sent back saying, no, thanks, you're grand. And, uh, but he put me in touch. I wrote some scenes for them and I, I sent it in and, and Johnny sent them to, to Lenny. And Lenny really Abramson. liked them, Lenny Abramson. And Lenny and I got together and we just shared a, 
we had overlapping tastes, should I say. We shared this interest in that kind of physical Lard and Hardy type comedy. He really liked the scenes that I wrote. He felt that there was an openness that allowed him in. Um, there was an open-endedness to them. And so that was pretty much what had happened. So I wrote it for them. Uh, we spent a year getting it together and then we got the money and we made it. That's kind yeah, of- I, I've yet to meet somebody who didn't uh, just love that film. I, I, it's um, one that that really grabs people, but it's also quite bleak. Um, there is, it's hard to escape and you're talking about all the reading. I mean, it's hard to escape echoes of Beckett yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there's, it's impossible to write a play nowadays without referencing Waiting for Godot. Like it is the ground zero of all modern theatre. Um, I think it's impossible to do any work without it. And I think being an Irish person, writing something about homelessness and blah, 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 without going into kind of verite kitchen sink drama, you're, you're straight back there, you know, you're back with Didi and Gogo, really. And I love the ballast exchanging what is at times nonsense at times accidental wisdom um at times sure. lyrical cries for but also he got it from a vaudevillian setting so like his you know larlin hardy are there he you know he he worked with buster keaton making a film uh, beckett did so it was kind of that kind of tradition i wanted to tap into yeah. as well i like i like sight gags and funny knockabout things and you know for me the things like Tom breaking his hand against the car or getting knocked down by a moped or getting a football in the face. Like those things are funny to me. Um, uh, and then after Adam and Paul, you did the, the only one I know of that you did that's um, a rural set drama, which was Garage. Yeah. That's your only one that's not, um, I mean, well, Vivas is, oh no, I guess Prosperity was set in Ennis too. No, Prosperity was set in Dublin. <clears throat> Garage very much was about me seeing whether the only thing I could write was observe Dublin language. And I wanted to see whether I could write a rural drama. It was literally that kind of a thing. I wanted to see whether my voice could adapt to that sort of a, a setting or whether I was a one trick pony. Um, turns out I was a two trick pony, which is kind of good. Uh, but also it was a kind of a memory piece. I wanted to write about Ennis in a certain way. And I also, like I was living in Ennis at the time, uh, living in Dublin at the time and the Celtic tiger was there and I could see the way that the Celtic tiger was tearing the ecosystem, that ecosystem that we had been talking about earlier about small town ecosystem, that small town uh, community was tearing them, tearing it apart. And it meant that that person in every small Irish town who's seen as the village idiot or the, the village eccentric or the, the town simpleton that in you know in the celtic tiger they became uh economically inert units yeah yeah and they pushed out and squashed out and and i wanted to write about that so i found that story and i was really interested in and, and lenny was really encouraging of it you know and then uh, prosperity is the only thing that uh, of yours that i haven't seen and that was a, a tv series is um it was 2007 or 2008 and was right at the top of the Celtic Tiger thing. And I was just furious about the whole thing. Like I was just sitting around watching all of this. And, it, you know, in the middle of it, they had the fucking um, citizenship referendum and everything. And I was just, my, I was nauseated by the whole thing. And also there was this thing going around that the only people on welfare were, were lazy people or idiots. And I was like, there's a whole class of people who are, including the artists, art sector, who are completely locked out of this fabulous prosperity that you talk about. And so I decided to write about them. And I, the way I wrote that series was, I had one or two ideas for stories in my head, but I you know, stood on the corner of, of O'Connell Street and North Earl Street, and I followed people around all day, and I observed stories that I saw, and they became the episodes of that TV series. And they all the episodes overlap. I think it's a really, I think it's a really great TV series, actually. Um, RT have never um, rebroadcast it. Yeah, I, I I tried to find a way to see it, um, and I I couldn't. Um... I don't know what their problem is with it. I think they've treated it really badly, actually. Uh, but I think it's very strong. Uh, and then he did extraordinary work on it, as they say. Um, 
And then I, we need to um, jog along because I just, um, the time is, is run away from us. Um, you made a film set in Cuba. Uh, yes. Again, that was a test in lots of ways. I had stopped once, T Tom Murphy died in, in uh, 2007. And I was very, uh, I was very, uh, broken sounds very dramatic, but I was very, I was broken by the whole thing. And I didn't want to write anymore and I didn't want to act anymore. And I, I went off traveling for a while and I came back and I started acting again in the theater. And then I kind of, began to miss writing a bit. I tried to write a few things and they didn't go anywhere. They petered out. And I was like, oh, well, that's my writing career is gone for, done for. And so I, was, I wasn't that upset by that. I was kind of going like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll keep acting. And then I got asked to write a play and I wrote this short play called Trade. And that was at the same time I had been asked by, by Paddy Brannock, would I be interested in writing something that was set in Cuba? And I said, yeah. So he and I went on holidays. In fact, I wrote trade while I was on holidays over there. But we went and investigated. And it became this kind of, through the writing of, of Viva, I, I learned to write again because I wasn't able to at the time. And it was a really interesting one because I had to go and live in this place and get to know this other culture and pick up on people's, trying to be as authentic as possible and, it was a great thing. And Paddy was, was really brilliant. He, when I got stuck, sometimes he, he was always such a brilliant help. And then we went on this great adventure making it over there. It was a really brilliant, it was a really brilliant experience. And I'm really proud of that film. I have to say, and the actors are gorgeous in it. It's filmed beautifully by Kyle Waters. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a, it's a gorgeous film. And uh, the one after it, uh, Rialto is, um, it's a very different kind of, uh, feeling it's a much more it's a much more austere mm. uh, um, sort of uh, uh, palette you use there isn't it well I think um, obviously Rialto is very Irish but uh, I wanted to write something about a man who who hits a sort of crisis of identity and doesn't know himself anymore and the fear that that engenders and and the people he harms as he tries to step out of himself or step away from himself. And it's a complicated drama, you know, it's not easy, but it's it's had a nice life and I'm very proud of it as well. I think that the, the two main guys in it are are just wonderful. They're extraordinary performances. They really yeah. are extraordinary, yeah. And mm -hmm. it's, uh, but there's also some of the minor characters at the side, um, there's also some, some great cameos in it. Yeah, but I think Sophie Jo Watson, who plays his daughter is really beautiful in it. Um, the woman who plays his wife um, is gorgeous, and her name completely evades me now. I can't remember. And the father, and the father's lover, is a very interesting character. This yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that idea of this woman who, who halted her life and being this, you know, she's known by everybody that she's, that she was his father's lover, but nobody acknowledges it. In fact, they look down on her. Uh, it wasn't that uncommon a thing, you know. No. Um... There's loads more I'd love to talk to you about Rialto, but um, so we don't have much time. I want to ask you about some of the stuff you're up to now, Mark. Um, yeah. One of the things you're doing is um, uh, adapting novels for the screen. So tell us a bit yeah. about that. So uh, this this kind of happened during lockdown. I, I am one of the writers on the new Sally Rooney adaptation, the adaptation of her first novel, which is being done by the same team that that did normal people it's conversations with friends um i found that really great uh her work is just really extraordinary it's a it's a really complicated love story uh that involves two couples who become entangled with each other basically and uh and it, that was that's been really great I, I was there almost as a staff writer in lots of ways like I didn't lead the adaptation I mean we were always involved in 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 discussing the, the work and la 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 uh, the second one I'm involved with is ad adapting John Boyne's the the hearts invisible furies which I am on which I'm leading the adaptation and I'm going to write all the episodes and it's a 10 part 10 hour long episodes it's I mean, it, John's book, that particular book is, I think he's greatest book and it's certainly it's his most successful. It sells, well, besides the boy in the, the striped pajamas, but it, it continually is his greatest seller and it's a brilliant story. And it's an interesting, 
I find ad adapting very interesting. I think it's been said before that people say, you know, you pick a book that offers you a challenge, I suppose. You know, if it's a simple, if it was as simple as holding the pages open, just writing down the dialogue, you know, there's no room for you to be creative. But some books are, you know, the, the, the narrative can be interior or the way that the story is told isn't quite work for, for a screen adaptation. So you have to get in there and you've got to move things around as well as staying faithful to the tone and the story and the meaning of, of the novel. So I, I'm really enjoying that. And I'm adapting um, Louise Nealon's new book, Snowflake, which has just been released, which I believe is being very successful at the moment. So um, well, actually, first of all, everybody, a reminder that we're open for questions now. So put your questions into the chat and, and we'll put them to Mark. Um, so there's a question about that exact um, topic from Catherine, um, who asks, how do you approach adapting someone else's work for screen? What do you do? Like, where, where do you start? You have the, so you have Sally Rooney's conversations with friends in front of you. What, what happens next? Well, I think that each project is different uh, with with conversations, there was five. There are five writers on it. Um, four writers on it. There are four writers on it, and we all got on Zoom calls. It was just as lockdown had happened back in March 2020, and we talked out where we thought the novel was at. Then there were these breakdowns given to us into episodes, and we all came reconvened and we talked about where we thought each episode had its strengths or weaknesses. And then I was given breakdowns for three episodes, basically. And uh, and what you do is you, you get in there and dialogue in a novel is different to dialogue on the screen. So you've got to make sure that it feels dynamic and, and, uh, and real. I wasn't then involved in the kind of a looking, the, the editorial team is in charge of making sure that everything is working across episodes or blah, blah, blah. And they shifted things around and you'd get rewrites on that from that because they'd have moved some storyline that needs to be incorporated into yours or whatever. With the John Boyne one, it's different in that, firstly, they're hour long episodes and I'm the only writer on it. So you've got two kind of, um, two, modus operandi I suppose and one is you've got to be true to the story and make sure that it works on the screen and you've got to be aware of what the author is trying to do and sometimes there's a gap between those two things and you've got to sit in that gap and you've got to move things around and um, hopefully you know uh, John has read the script the first script that I've written on that adaptation and he really likes it so that's good I think my my own judgment is that if you write it well enough the author shouldn't re re shouldn't really see the changes you've done because, or even some of the readers shouldn't see it because you're true to the spirit of it, but you're just making it work as a piece of drama. I mean, I mean to what extent, extent do you, sorry, to what extent do you feel you're, um, you know, sort of bringing the novel to the screen and to what extent do you think you're making something new um, out of the, I think you take the world of the novel and you make it into a screenplay. So you leave the novel behind. Um, you know, the novel, the world of the novel only exists in each of the various readers' heads. And I suppose the, the world that I get from the novel is in my head and I have got to put that down on the page and make sure that it pops up for the, for the, the directors and all. Yeah, I suppose we're always doing, as we read novels, we're always making adaptations in our brain, all right, because we're yeah. kind of staging it, as it were, yeah. Um, with, with John's work, what I do is I generally open a file and I move all of the dialogue from, from each chapter that I'm doing, the, each, each episode, and I move all of the, the dialogue so that I can use not verbatim dialogue because dialogue from novels usually doesn't work on screen, but you can use the shape or the context of the lines that he has so that a reader will feel as if they're recognizing the dialogue. Mm. Um, mm. But you've got to get in there and be muscular with it as well. Um, so here's a, a comment rather than a question from Edeth. And she says, I remember you from Ennis years ago. That's always a oh god. You know, where 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 is this going to go? I didn't like growing up there at all, and was really unhappy as a teenager. But you're making me feel differently about the place. James Tierney was the best. Um, right. That's the, the guy with the hats. Um, so here's another question: As an actor, what do you look for in a script? 
a straight offer. <laughs> That's a good answer. And then um, this is an interesting one now, um, because this you could apply this to various parts of your work, I think. Uh, when you were writing Adam and Paul, did you ever think that you would make them gay? No, absolutely not. I, 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 I got this essay that was done by he was somebody that I kind of knew, but he's an academic and he wrote this uh, uh, treatise about Adam and Paul and how they were a queer couple. In the same way that Lyle and Hardy, you know, you can put Lyle and Hardy often shared a bed together or blah, blah, blah. I think it would have added a layer that wasn't necessary. I wasn't trying to comment on their sexuality. I, I suppose I was trying to comment on their humanity in a way, in a, in a, in a, in a different, in a way, you know? Um, does that answer that? Yeah, it, it does. I mean, it's also, it's not a love story in a way. Um, but actually, I think it is a love story in a weird sort of way, but it's too straight boy. They need each other and they, and they, they can't exist without each other in a way, you know? I suppose what I mean is that in terms of a narrative trajectory, we're not, they're all, they're all, they're existing in this, uh, with this, these, this strong bond of affection between them. We're not headed towards a great climax of um, coming together. No, and I think it would have gotten away, it would have gotten in the way of the narrative that I was trying to work with, I think. And there's, because there's, there's other ceremonies in that one mentioned, and also in Rialto, and I'm just struck by this, that in both of those, um, there's a mention of month's mind, and I, yeah. um, I, I, I don't know quite what my question is, but I was just struck when I saw it that I knew it was a detail that reminded me of Adam and Paul, and um, that the the key ceremony is this this key kind of ritual ceremony we have at the center of it, or it's not quite the center in Adam and Paul, but it, it is in Rialto. Yeah, is what's quite a kind of marginal. Uh, it's not the funeral. It's not a wedding. Um, any, it, but it's about memory. Um, I think it's about morning. the real friends turn up on the month's mind. Yeah. The real committed family members call around and say, are you all right? Or you'll turn up at the mass at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning and it's a month afterwards and you'll find the strangest people that you didn't think loved your loved one as much as you did are there. Or, And I think it's a kind of a, I also like the fact that it mirrors Buddhist thoughts where in Buddhist thought, I'm not a religious person, but I'm, I'm fascinated with Buddhism and storytelling and Buddhism and all that, that they say that the soul wanders the earth for 40 days before it leaves. It can leave before that, either through rebirth or reaching nirvana or whatever. But, you know, the month's mind is a fairly similar thing. And it's not, it's not uniquely Catholic or even uniquely Buddhist. There's also other um beliefs that have that 30 40 day thing a month thing i suppose it's the moment as well when the kind of for want of a better word glamorous side of morning is over and yeah you're kind of getting back to the um the, to the normality of it. so there's a question from ailish um hugh lane is one of my heroes and i loved citizen lane was this a personal project or commissioned and what led to the docudrama format it was commissioned, I think the docudrama thing, I mean, I wrote a full script for it, actually, but uh, we just didn't have the money to make it. And and so there was always going to be some sort of a talking head. It literally was what evolved as we were doing the project. I love Hugh Lane. I just think he was a fascinating character and really bold and kind of, you know, I liked, I, you know, I you know, he was very obviously a homosexual as far as I was concerned. And I liked the idea of him and Casement crossing over each other at times, you know, two very different people. I think that, that Hugh Lane was interesting because he, he always lived between two worlds. He was born in Cork, but he was brought up in England. He wanted to give art to the people, yet he was part of the bourgeoisie. He was a dealer as well as uh, somebody who gave art away. Like he was all of these things and he, he was he was an Irish nationalist with a very small N and the times around him were radicalizing and he tried to stay in the center. It's a, he's, he's an interesting figure after the, the war of independence and all of that afterwards as well, because at the time he was trying to give the modern gallery to Dublin, the Sinn Féin and the Dublin city council were like, he can take his English paintings and shove them up his arse. And when the, when he was dead and, you know, 
the 1916 happened he died in 1915 1916 and then they were screaming at the brits saying you stole our irish heritage by keeping the paintings you know and suddenly hugh lane was was held to the chest and given you know this is the great hugh lane he was a lot of things to a lot of people i like those kind of shapeshifters and there's just people might not not everybody knows i mean um, who's listening i suppose there's a uh, gallery named after him in, um, in, in, in and it's, it holds yeah. it holds the the his impressionist collection um in it and it's a fabulous resource it's free to go visit uh, I'd hi- they're open again aren't they galleries there Museum. i think so yeah i think i think i saw they were um from painting then to music you are writing a libretto we haven't mentioned that yeah. yes it's a libretto that's based on my my play trade which also is what Rialto's is based on flogging a dead horse, flogging that horse. But my niece is a, an opera composer. She studied in Princeton over in the United States and she's got her doctorate in modern composition. And she won this uh, big comp- composition um, and won this big competition in, in uh, New York uh, where she created a half hour opera based on an older play of mine called Mary Motorhead. And she won this competition, which was a commission to write a full length uh opera so we're going to do it in new york next january we're also going to bring it back to ireland the ino will be producing it i don't think they've released their program so i won't say when but it'll be around next year i think we might be going to places like la with it as well and touring it's quite a my niece is just very talented i'm very impressed with her uh i i I believe you when you say that but what you have to do is also quite difficult i mean you're not used to writing verse i suppose well, it isn't written in verse, really. It's uh, it's one of those operas where modern language, but what you do is you pull the language right down to its essence. You know, in a play, the language holds up the story, whereas in an opera, the music is holding the story or is telling or is leading the narrative and the words are really a guide for it. And so you got to pull it and pull it and pull it back until it's at its bare essence. So we did all that last year, again, during lockdown. Um, so... Mm, this, um, by the way, Laura is just confirming that galleries are open. I suppose for the museum is open, so the gall- gall- galleries are open. Um, so how do you, tell me a bit about how you move between all of these um, different um, genres that you're working in. I mean, that it just it seems like a lot to have going on in um, one head at any given time. Yeah, I mean. Um... For years, I thought I used to be struck down with with writer's block and I'd write very slowly. And then during lockdown, I just had no excuses. So I wrote 10 scripts in in the in, the, in 2020, the calendar year 2020. And I mean, some of them were like half hour television scripts, but I've got two plays that are going on this year, later this year. I did the libretto. I did a couple of episodes of this TV series about Roger Caseman's time in the in South America. I did the adaptation. I, I started the adaptation of the John Boyne thing. So there was lots of things, but I found it really interesting that I had lots to do, you know, that I had lots of different things to hop around to. I was living alone during lockdown. I found it kind of, the whole time was weird as we all know, we all went through it. When you're living on your own, it's a bit odder, I thought. I was I was just going a bit mad, you know. Um, so the work helped. I certainly don't have writer's block anymore. Well, I, God, I mean, you, you, you couldn't, I mean, you, there's not much room for it with all those deadlines. No, um, you just kind of, yeah. Uh, I, when you write for television, there is no room for it because you have to hit those deadlines because they'll come after you otherwise. And you have to hit it, you, you know, you know, with a film script, you know, you can say, I'll have it by the end of February. And if you drop it in on the third week of March, you're grand. <laughs> if you say you have a television script at 4 p.m. on Thursday evening, you should have it in by five to four, really. Wow. Yeah, that, I suppose you have to get up. So how, how, how does it work then? I mean, for you day to day, do you wake up and know exactly what project it is? I mean, how does... Yeah, I try. I, you know, I've i tried doing multiple projects where I do the morning on one, the afternoon on another, the evening in another. For a while that worked, doesn't really work for me at the moment. So I take them one at a time and I go, OK, I if I take two weeks on this, I can finish it and move on to that. I can do five days on that and do a redraft of it, send that off. I can do this. I can do that. So 
and it's worked quite well for me. You know, I, I was writing two plays at the same time and I really liked bouncing between the, those two uh, at the same time. So I wrote them concurrently. And um, any uh, thoughts about something you really want to do? Um, because your career has taken all of these interesting turns. And I mean, is there, is there another turn that you um, hope for or predict that might be had? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I literally look at things and if they're a challenge, I'll say yes. Uh, if I feel that I'm not really capable of doing something, but I'm still excited by it, I'll say yes to it. Um, I remember when my niece commissioned me to write the, the libretto for her, her producer rang me from America and was like, okay. And I said, grand. But the next day I was like, oh, Jesus. So I rang her and said, Emma, does it have to rhyme? And she was like, no, it doesn't have to rhyme. And I was like, okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. I try, I'll take on any kind of things. With writing, with, with acting, it's a lot different because I don't get offered a lot of write, uh, acting work and I take what comes my way basically to be honest with you um, I, I, do you miss acting yeah at times I do at times I do um, for its sociability and for that kind of challenge of being physically active in the world I do and then sometimes you know it's nice to be just waking up and going downstairs and going into your little writing room and scribbling away there all day and then taking a walk is kind of nice as well. I suppose it's a different conception of an audience as well. As, um, of, like, who's I think, the you know, I might be wrong in this, but I think it all comes from the same place in the brain. I don't think, I don't have to access a different part of my brain to be an actor. It's always the invention of character through, through mm. dialogue and action. And that's, you know, it's just, you have to embody one. But I think I, I come at characters in a in a script as an actor you know I, I i think of them in physical action i can hear the tonation of their voice when i'm putting it down so i i that's the way i come at something it probably is helpful for the actors all right and um, that there's an actor writing the script uh, so you're actually uh, already pre-embodying it for them i hope so yeah um so there's a question from Henrietta. Uh, when working on multiple projects, oh yeah, do you find you have an idea for one that really belongs to the other? No, but sometimes when you're working on one, something clarifies about something else unknowns to you. Something will click. You'll be halfway through and you'll go, fuck it. And you'll write a little note for yourself. And it's just because you're not... Your, your subconscious works, I think, in, on many different levels. And sometimes it needs you to, like I do a lot of walking and I find walking to be a very creative process because my mind, my conscious mind is trying to work my feet and my subconscious mind is at play. And so I get a lot of dialogue ideas on my walks. And uh, I would say it's essential to my creative work. Walking. Yeah which sounds ridiculous. Not cycling, because you have to think too much of the traffic when you're cycling, but walking, yeah, for sure. Well, maybe with the new cycle lanes, you'll be able to um, Perhaps. worry about the traffic. So you have to stop when you're on the bicycle, whereas when I'm on a walk, I just take out my phone, I put the note down into, mess, into iNotes. So that's you, you have your phone to take the notes and you go, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, um, we're, we've just hit the hour, so... Um, that was fascinating. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you so much. It was a great joy. It was um, very interesting. Um, so everybody, the next uh, edition of this is on the 7th of July with uh, Claire Kilroy. So I hope to see lots of you then. And uh, in the meantime, thanks again, Mark. Thank Love you. you.